Hi, everyone. Welcome to Drupal uh, NYC, uh, to our May meetup. Uh, this is our monthly meetup. We're really glad to have you here. Um, can I get a show of hands? How many people have been to a Drupal NYC meetup before? Okay, almost everyone. Well, welcome back. And for whom is this their first Drupal NYC meetup? I see one, I see two, I see three, four, four. Welcome. Welcome to you all. Glad to have you here. Um, Wi-Fi information is at the bottom here if you want to connect. Uh, along with a whole bunch of other links, uh, we would love to have you, you know, connect with us elsewhere. All right, so this is a new venue for us. We've never uh, done it here before, so we're still figuring out some of the technology, so bear with us. Um, let's see here. All right, the clicker doesn't seem to be working. Am I too far away? Oh, here we go. Did you click for me, or was that me? <laughs> Needs to be closer, okay. Right by the beer. That's where I want to be. It works. Okay. So some housekeeping. Please uh, mute your devices. <laughs> I should probably do that, huh? Follow my lead here. And um, if you have a question, uh, certainly there'll be time for questions. We're going to have a mic to pass around. Uh, please do speak into the mic. Uh, that'll ensure that your question and uh, all the information uh, gets added to the recording. We do record every meetup, uh, and we aim to publish those uh, online as soon as we can for anybody who wants to review the material or who wasn't able to make it. Uh, also, there are restrooms in the back. Uh, men's is to the right, and women's is to the left. Stage right, stage left. You're so right. Oh, okay, so we're in New York, we're right on Broadway, so we should all know this. Stage right means to, I hope I get this right, my right, because I'm on the stage looking at you, my left. <laughs> Phew. All right, so our agenda today, um, announcements, that's now, uh, and presentations are coming up shortly, and then we'll have some closing remarks, um, and uh, there's more pizza and more uh, drinks over there, please help yourself. Uh, and then we're going to have an after party uh, at House of Brews, and uh, we'll have more details on the after party uh, on our last slide tonight. Um, it's not far away. <laughs> got my click helper now. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we've got three talks today. First, we've got a lightning talk uh, by Jeremy Mikola, uh, Dive into the MongoDB PHP driver. Uh, then we're going to hear from Kermit Ramirez using Drupal to create a digital patient education experience at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And then uh, Kevin Basarab, did I say that right? Yes, Basarab, almost. Uh, UX editorial shift, that'll be very interesting. Uh, so these are your organizers. Um, and hey, there's this spot right in the middle there. Uh, you could be an organizer too. All you have to do is find an organizer and talk to them, and we would love to have your help. There's lots to do. There's a lot that goes into each of these meetups, um, and so we'd love your help. And let's go back. We'll go back to the organizers. If you're an organizer, can you please stand up? It's helpful for all the organizers. Stand up, put your hand up there. We'd love to uh, have you come to one of us uh, with any questions. Uh, we're here for you. Thank you. Okay, so quick update on Drupal NYC Incorporated. So this is our, our new nonprofit um, organization uh, to manage uh, Drupal NYC and uh, the events in New York City for the Drupal community. Um, fairly new news is the IRS recently granted the 501c3 tax exemption status. So we are legitimately a charitable organization. Woo! That's all I know. Um, I think we, uh, oh yeah, we can go on, sorry. <laughs> And give up on this clicker. Um, okay, so our venue today, uh, food and drinks, uh, all sponsored by MongoDB. Thank you, MongoDB. Please give them a round of applause. Really appreciate their help. Uh, without sponsors like MongoDB, uh, we would not have a venue. We would not be able to do these meetups. We would not be able to have you here. We would not have any food or drinks. So thank you. Um, okay, so we don't uh, have an after party sponsor anymore. Um, 
So we are in need of sponsors. Uh, you could, it could be an ongoing sponsor for every meetup. It could be a one-off sponsor for just one meetup. Uh, you know, a few hundred dollars goes a really long way to helping build and maintain uh, this great community that we have here uh, for Drupal in New York City. Um, so if you work for a company uh, that you know works with Drupal or sells to people who use Drupal, uh, we would really love your support. It's a great way to get out in front of your uh, constituents, your community, uh, and make a difference. So uh, please find any organizer, or you can get in touch with us on our website or Slack. Okay, speaking of Slack, Slack is a great place uh, to join this community um, in the online world, um, as is Twitter. So you can find us there. Um, if you haven't gotten on Slack before, it's really easy. Um, nothing to be scared of. So, you know, be sure to, to head on over there. Okay, so yeah, please feel free to take photos. Um, and we use the Drupal NYC hashtag. Uh, and you can upload your photos to the meetup page. We hope to see you there. Okay, the Drupal Association. Um, can I see a show of hands? How many people are members of the Drupal Association? Okay, that's like half, almost half the room. I would love to see everybody in this room become a member of the Drupal Association. It is inexpensive. It's a quick little donation, uh, and it means you're contributing back to the Drupal community in you know one small way, uh, however else uh, you might be. So please consider that. Um, they do a lot for, for Drupal, and uh, we want to support them. Upcoming events. <laughs> so there's a big red other events <laughs> because nobody nobody filled in that spot on the slides. Um, so I'm sure there are other events besides Drupal Delphia, which is coming up on May 10th. Uh, and you can find those events at uh, drupalcal.com and at groups.drupal.org slash events. Does anybody know of any upcoming events that they want to uh, want me to speak into this microphone here? Anybody? Design, design for Drupal in Boston. In June, we think. Research. <laughs> All right. So if you are interested in speaking, we are always looking for speakers. Uh, it can be any length. It can be real, real short. It can be longer. Um, whether it's uh, you know beginner, advanced, even a non drupal -y thing, as long as there's um, you know some interest for the Drupal community, uh, we'd love to know. Yes, sir. Decoupled Drupal. That is coming up. When is that? In June? July. D couple is it dev Drupal Dev Days okay. at, John at John Jay College coming up soon. I went to that last year. I should really know what it's called. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so please uh, contact an organizer. We'd love to have you speak. Um, you know, all the speakers are volunteers. All the organizers are volunteers, and this meetup is not what it is uh, without our volunteers. So please volunteer to speak um, or in any other way you can. Thanks. Okay, so uh, show of hands, who is looking to hire uh, somebody in the Drupal space? Anybody looking to hire Drupal-y people? Show of hands, show of hands. Yes, sir. So uh, Media Current, we're a digital agency looking to hire Drupal developers, uh, front-end developers. Uh, Drupal experience is great. Uh, for front-end, not necessarily required, though, so let me know if you're interested. All remote. Okay, anybody else hiring? Anybody else? This is your chance. All right. Uh, is there anybody looking for work? I see somebody in the back here. Anybody else looking for work? You can say your name and what, you're, what you do, and somebody can find you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Yarmo Karyalainen. and I'm a visual designer and a branding designer. Fantastic. Anybody else? No other freelancers? Well, I'm a freelancer. I'm always looking for work. I'm JD. By the way, hi. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Okay, so uh, this is my favorite part. So take five minutes and find somebody near you or not near you, introduce yourself, have a little discussion. And then uh, as our usual MC Alex always says, I will aim to interrupt you at the least opportune time. It'll be really awkward and fantastic. So take a minute, find somebody you don't know, have a quick chat. Please wrap up your conversation because now it is time for our talks. We've got three wonderful talks today, and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Jeremy McCullough uh, up to the stage. Um, he is going to be giving a lightning talk called Dive into the MongoDB PHP Driver. He's in charge of the Mongo PH MongoDB PHP Driver, so he's a good person to talk about that. Um, so welcome, Jeremy, everyone. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Jeremy. Um, I've been to a few Drupal meetups before. I think the, the last a few nice camps. Uh, I was just talking to somebody that works at the UN. Um, 
It's the last time I was there, so I don't know if it's still held there. So years ago. Um, so as I mentioned, I work on the PHP driver. I work with Chris. Uh, he's, he develops the Go driver. Uh, so we have a bunch of, we all wear a bunch of hats. Uh, there was a miscommunication, so this talk is actually entitled Dive into PHP Driver. Um, so just five minutes, I just want to give an overview of how the driver works, a little bit of MongoDB. Um, I guess just a quick show of hands since we're here, uh, kind of legally obligated to ask. Has anyone used MongoDB uh, before or is familiar with it? Uh, you look very familiar. I think you were at one of the open camps uh, a couple of years ago. Yes, okay. <laughs> so he's got the hoodie already. Okay, we can give this guy a prize later. Um, so if not, I won't take up too much of your time. Um, but uh, if anything, just give you some exposure to a uh, another PHP library. Uh, so you can go back, even if you're not using MongoDB. Uh, you can tell your uh, company or boss, oh, you learned something uh, at the meetup in addition to the other talks. Uh, so some deployments. Uh, I just want to um, uh, different quickly go through some quick ways that we uh, deploy MongoDB. Uh, it comes in three kind of varieties here. Uh, there is the standalone variety, uh, which is you running it on your own own machine. Uh, offers no protections if, if the machine shuts off, uh, so the, the data is also gone. Um, in most deployments, uh, we have a replication uh, set up. It's kind of like running a uh, replication with a SQL database. Uh, so in this, you'd have uh, some number of nodes, and then if, if one goes away, the, the other one steps up, and so your application can still talk to it. And that black box there would be the driver and your application, whether it's Drupal application, Symfony, um, Laravel, et cetera. Uh, and then there's also sharding. Uh, if you're looking uh, to really complicate your life uh, and create more problems for yourself, you can manage MongoDB on a, a wide cluster of things. Uh, and each one of those be multiple app servers can talk. And usually with PHP, we uh, typically deploy with a whole bunch of app servers. Uh, there's another slide I cut where I put like a grid of a thousand different app servers up there, but I'll, I'll spare you that. Um, and the benefit of sharding is um, also like a SQL database, we have multiple writable nodes. So that, that's where you get your scalability if you, if you need to write a lot of stuff. Uh, and each one of these things is uh, ideally also does replication. Uh, so you get scalability and you get the redundancy as well. Uh, so that's it for the deployments. Uh, again, we only have five minutes. Uh, so I'm going to, for the purpose of example, uh, introduce MongoDB Atlas, which is our cloud-hosted MongoDB platforms, you can just click a few buttons and start up a cluster uh, without having to, uh, to manage any servers yourself. Um, this is uh, easily available uh, from our own website uh, and just give you a look of uh, what the UI looks like. It basically starts out and you kind of pick which cloud provider you want. Um, by default, it uses AWS. Um, and you can pick your regions, et cetera, and then also adjust like, how many servers do you want? Do you want sharding? Do you want backup services? How much storage? All that stuff. Uh, conveniently, there's a free option, um, which will give you a uh, replication, so you get the, the backup uh, benefit. Uh, and you can start that easily and point an app to, towards it, which I've, I've done here. Um, and once you set up that uh, free cluster, you can just leave it running um, throughout the month. Um, you won't get, you don't need, I don't believe you need to add payment information or anything like that. Sean's shaking his head, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, and it'll give you a little connection string, and then I'm going to demonstrate how you pop this into the PHP driver and just uh, show you a few scripts to to do the bare minimum of interacting with the database here. Uh, so it'll give you a connection string for whether in this case PHP, but if you're using any of the other drivers, it'll uh, could also give you a code example uh, to start off the application. And the PHP driver itself um, comes in two parts. Uh, so one is a Peckle extension. If people are familiar with that, those are uh, PHP extensions written in C, just like the PHP language. Um, uh, some common ones would be like the xdebug, uh, debugger tool is one. Uh, some extra other database drivers like the, the Redis driver, um, APC cache, those are examples of extensions in Peckle. Uh, and then composer packages, and hopefully we all have uh, used those before, um, at least in the last couple of versions of Drupal, I know using Symfony packages. Um, and so the uh, two parts you're going to install is first going to be the MongoDB extension. Uh, you can install that via Peckle. Uh, if you're using uh, Windows, the Peckle website also has DLL files. Uh, good luck finding out where to paste those, <laughs> but somewhere in the php.net documentation. Um, so installing the extension, adding it to your INI, INI file as well, and then the composer package, uh, and then it'll just download that, and there's really no dependencies other than the, uh, the Peckle driver itself. Uh, and so the extension uh, basically just does the very low-level stuff as a very basic no-frills API, uh, and we have a C driver uh, that implements that basically the PHP driver wraps around uh, and so basically does the networking and the um, all the protocol stuff. Um, 
And then uh, for my personal sanity of not wanting to write everything in C, uh, the PHP package uh, builds upon that extension that has all the high-level APIs. Uh, so all the, the CRUD methods that do inserts, updates, uh, deletes, um, a lot of uh, command wrappers and, and the, the nice API. And so that's uh, really what you'd be developing your application against. Uh, and also mentioned the Drupal uh, module that uh, Frederick uh, Morand uh, works on that creates a database abstraction on top of MongoDB that uh, I believe just uses the library directly. Uh, and so the basically core classes that you find in the library, and there's uh, we have two different namespaces. Uh, all the stuff that's written in pure PHP sits in uh, the MongoDB namespace. Uh, and everything that the driver has uh, is mostly in the MongoDB driver uh, namespace in the extension. Uh, and so we have uh, three top-level objects, um, which are kind of analogous to a SQL, where you have a, the database um, and the, the tables uh, therein. So client is your initial object that talks to the database server. Uh, you have a database, which is your, that holds all the tables, basically, and a collection represents an individual uh, table of data uh, to make the SQL analogy. Uh, and there's some extra classes there. Uh, the most common one you'll end up using is a cursor. Uh, so when we run a query, uh, similar if you've used um, like the PDO extension in PHP, if you run a query, you get like a result object. And that's where you iterate to get your database results. Uh, so in the MongoDB driver's case, we have a cursor object for that. Uh, and so some examples of just what this looks for, um, what this looks like in the, the next couple of slides here. Uh, we're using the composer package, so we'll load the autoloader here. Uh, the Atlas UI gave, gave me a connection string uh, that I just pasted into my application. So I'm going to construct a new client with that connection string. Uh, it's very similar to a SQL DSN uh, with, a, with using PDO. Uh, that'll create this client object. And from there, I can select either a database or a collection object directly uh, to work with, um, get a handle on some place where I can interact with data. Uh, so I'll create a collection in the uh, test database in the frameworks collection. Uh, and then collectively that forms a, in MongoDB parlance would be a namespace. Um, so database.collection name um, in uh, whether you're using the shell or other drivers. Uh, and then from the collection, I can uh, drop it if in case there was any additional data there. I just wanted to start fresh for this example uh, and then just insert a bunch of documents here. Um, and so one thing we're skipping is um, I'm not creating any schema or anything. I'm just inserting uh, what looks like normal associative arrays or just PHP. I could insert PHP objects as well. Uh, and what I'm not showing here about what we could do is um, we're not just limited to flat fields, so we can uh, certainly use like uh, strings, numbers, uh, booleans, and then also store other nested objects or arrays. Um, so the, there's, no, um, there's no need to uh, denormalize the data into flat tables, basically. Uh, but in this case, just going to insert a couple of uh, simple documents that have names of uh, web frameworks uh, as well as the programming language. On the next example here, I'm going to issue a find query against the same collection after I've inserted the data. Uh, language PHP, this is uh, the equivalent of the query language. Uh, so here I'm just uh, field name on the left, value on the right. So I want to find everything where the language is equal to PHP. Uh, and then the cursor is this iterable thing, as I mentioned a few slides ago, so we can uh, run it through a for each loop. Um, and then each document is going to be the results that come back. Uh, so for each of these, I'll just output the name in a new line. Uh, we'll see those three things. It's going to skip uh, Ruby and Spring since those are not PHP frameworks. Uh, and then an example of uh, another, com another CRUD command would be just count the documents in the collection. Uh, so in this case, again, also using uh, query language. Uh, and here, instead of uh, matching, I want to use an uh, example of an operator here to say not equal to PHP. Um, and this is going to count the other two uh, frameworks that I inserted. Uh, so there's a wealth of different query operators to use. Um, and the main takeaway of coming from a SQL background is instead of writing uh, SQL queries with our criteria, we're basically developing um, uh, objects, structures to kind of represent the criteria. Um, one other example of what the actual thing that we're getting back, what the result looks like. Um, so I alluded to BSON earlier. It's, um, we like to refer to it as binary JSON. It's not strictly compatible with JSON, but it's very similar. Uh, but this is the binary format that MongoDB stores its documents in. Uh, and so it's the PHP extension's responsibility to turn your PHP objects or arrays into uh, the BSON format and vice versa. So we, when you're inserting data into database, we're converting the PHP structures into BSON for the server to store. When we get them back, we marshal them back into uh, PHP objects. Uh, so this is an example of what comes back for the driver. Um, and you'll notice on the previous page, I did 
didn't have to interact with this as an object. I was just accessing the, the name field as if it was an associative array. Uh, so that's one of the conveniences that we uh, aim to provide and every driver in every language tries to do the most idiomatic thing um, uh, in that language. Uh, and so you'll hopefully never actually have to var dump these things, um, but this is just what it looks like. Uh, and the one thing I want to point out here is we never created um, unique identifiers for any of these objects, but just like in a SQL database, every uh, database record should have some primary key. Uh, so MongoDB, uh, by default, decides to use this underscore ID field, and um, the drivers are responsible. We'll just populate an ID if you don't want to use one on your own. Uh, so we use these hashes, which are great, um, especially if you have a shard system with multiple um, uh, many nodes in it instead of using incrementing values. Um, but you're certainly welcome to use whatever value you want here as long as it's going to be unique for that collection. Uh, and then one final uh, code example here. Uh, so we did some inserting, some querying, uh, seeing what the BSON documents look like. Uh, one of the other powerful features we have is an aggregation framework. Uh, and this is um, basically our approach to not doing things like uh, a group by that you might have in SQL. Uh, so this is uh, the equivalent uh, in MongoDB. We do an aggregate, and it uh, we basically we just give an array of operations to run in a sequence. Um, kind of think of it like if you're running uh, shell scripts uh, from a bash shell, and you're going to pipe the results of one script into the next. So this forms a pipeline of different operations that mutate the documents. Uh, and so the first operation, uh, the collection, all the documents in the collection get fed into the pipeline. The first thing we do is group. Uh, and this, I'm going to organize them by the whatever the language field is, uh, and then use one of the accumulator functions, in this case sum, just to basically count how many languages there are, so how many frameworks there are per language. Uh, and then another example of another pipeline operator that can mutate, and in this case, change the order of the documents in the pipeline would be to sort them. In this case, I'm going to sort them uh, after we've grouped them by frameworks per language. I'm going to sort them so that we have the most populous ones first. Uh, and then we could just iterate that the same way we do a normal uh, if we did any other fine query, uh, and just dumping out uh, PHP has three frameworks, Java had one, Ruby had one. Uh, and again, there's a whole bunch more operators uh, beyond group and sort here um, that uh, I'll leave as an exercise if you're curious about this. Uh, we have a, a reasonably good manual uh, that goes through all these things. Uh, so driver documentation for the PHP driver itself. Uh, the extension, like most other PHP extensions, lives on php.net. Um, it's my life is a special hell of having to write the documentation in the php.net format. <laughs> Not as nice as writing our library documentation, which I get to use restructured text for. Uh, so that's much better. Um, and our ecosystem page uh, lists some details about the driver. This is basically hosted in the MongoDB manual. Uh, and the PHP libraries page there is also has uh, links to, uh, for various web frameworks, what is the like, uh, suggested MongoDB bundle or integration for that. Uh, that's Drupal integration is one of the ones that's listed there. Um, and if you have something that you want to add to that, uh, we take pull requests to, uh, to add things to that list. Um, then every year or so, we have to go and prune out the things that are <laughs> no longer maintained. Um, uh, thanks for your time, though. Uh, I'll stick around after the other talks if you have any questions about the driver. Uh, and happy to be here. I'll hand it over to Sean. All right, so next up, we've got Kermit Ramirez and Kermit. Kermit, please. He's been working at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center since 2007, and he's currently a web specialist for the Department of Patient and Caregiver Engagement. Uh, and he manages the Patient and Caregiver Education website and leads various technology-based projects and initiatives. And so Kermit here is going to talk to us about using Drupal to create a digital patient education experience at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Thanks very much, Kermit. Let's give a round of applause for Kermit. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kermit Ramirez, and I'm here to talk about how Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uses Drupal to create a uh, digital patient education experience. So a little about me. I've been at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center here in New York City since 2007. I have a CS background. Um, in 2011, I began working in my current role as web specialist for the Department of Patient and Caregiver Engagement. Uh, where I lead uh, our technology-based initiatives. My main responsibility at the hospital has been the public-facing patient and caregiver education website, which I'll be presenting today. And I've been a Drupal user since the hospital switched to Drupal several years ago, starting with Drupal 6. 
And also thanks to Jake Rockwitz over there, uh, who many of you know as the Webform guy. I was introduced to the Drupal community here in New York City. So since then, I've been able to attend many Drupal meetups, Drupal camps, Drupal cons, and all the older Drupals. Um, I've had the pleasure to meet some of the most inspiring people through this, and just sharing a little bit about my experience here today. All right, so the goal of today's session is to provide a history of the transition from physical copies of educational resources to dynamically generated multilingual PDFs. In doing so, I'll dive into the technologies utilized and methods applied to create the digital experience for patients and caregivers. I'll also discuss the custom admin and editor UI created for our team. Uh, this session is essentially for anyone trying to solve the problems we ran into while creating a custom digital library and experience for users. Uh, just a note here, I don't intend this to be uh, a technical talk, but if any questions arise after the session, I am more than happy uh, to connect you to the right people. All right. So here's some pre-Drupal history on the project. Um, regarding the department I work in, we are patient and caregiver engagement, as I said. Our patient and caregiver education program works alongside healthcare professionals to provide accurate, clear, and reliable educational resources to the global community. We're a pretty small team of eight, and we have three health education specialists whose roles can be defined as content editors. They are the users creating the educational resources alongside clinicians or content experts in various practices throughout the hospital. And we'll talk a bit about the editor experience throughout. Along with our graphics department, we produced hundreds of fact cards and even a few DVDs, pretty cool. Uh, when I first began working in the department, I recall seeing just stacks of printed materials stored in our office space to be distributed throughout the hospital. Clinicians would order hundreds of copies of a resource, it gets revised and they'd end up discarding whatever quantity remained in stock. And that was certainly an issue we needed to address. We also wanted to reduce the chance of outdated resources being in circulation. So around that same time, there was a huge push to have all of our content made available online. And again, we were connected with our friend Jake Rockwitz, who built and maintained a custom uh, CMS called the iNet tool. At that time, we also started working with our graphics department to create PDF versions of our fact cards to be uploaded to the new CMS. So with iNet tool in place, we were ready to go online. And so we did, and it wasn't robust, but it served its purpose for that time. We had a site that hosted our PDFs, allowed to sort by category, and even had a neat search. The problem here was that we only had PDF versions of our content online. These were documents created in Adobe InDesign by our graphics department from Word documents our editors provided. So as you can imagine, there was quite a process when making revisions to a resource. We just needed to figure out a better system. In addition, we were actually distributing educational DVDs to patients and caregivers. So of course, there was a demand to move our videos to the web. This was just something we couldn't do in our system at the time. Well, then we also started thinking about translations and Jake Rockwitz iNet tool supported the tagging languages for our PDF uploads, but plans were to grow the number of available translations and languages. So we needed a better way to manage them. Oh, and we just needed a better search. <laughs> We needed to be able to search the body of a document at least. Lastly, we needed to figure out how to get our resources to patients and caregivers electronically. So as luck would have it, the institution was moving mskcc.org to Drupal, Drupal 6 actually, and it was the right time for us. Uh, we got right to work with our web team and began development on a brand new website that could meet all the demands. So just to break down what Drupal 6 helped, helped us accomplish, we now had an admin UI. We could add dates to our revisions, track authors, keep notes for each node, among many additional features. We implemented Drupal search, which was now allowed us to search the body of a resource for keywords. We also figured out how to generate custom PDFs from HTML resources. So I'll go into that a bit more in depth throughout the talk. Uh, we had a multilingual site, which supported various languages. We had revisioning, which was huge. Our health education specialists were now keeping track of revisions right in Drupal. And those DVDs weren't produced anymore. So we had videos online and embedded our resources, embedded in our resources. So not too bad. So with this new setup, we were able to take all of our PDF resources and move them to Drupal. 
Once those were live, our content editors and I began creating HTML versions of new resources. And for existing resources, as revisions were needed, we went ahead and created an HTML version for those as well. Yeah, so here's a screenshot of what the site looked like back then. This was our homepage when we were on Drupal 6. So like all projects on the web, the work is never done. We're always building and improving. So one big thing we wanted to figure out was how to manage our chemotherapy and medication resources. So we produce hundreds of resources for medications and there were always changes to that kind of content. So considering the hospital was already using a service called LexiComp uh, for access to a library of medication leaflets, we actually partnered up with LexiComp and set up to sync all of their medication leaflets to our site nightly via FTP. And with that, we were able to stop producing in-house medication resources. And since now there were less print versions of our resources in our office space, our department went ahead and embarked on what was known as our green initiative. The plan was to reduce the quantity of print resources in circulation. This was achieved by figuring out which print resources weren't being distributed so much and making them available on the web only. Also, every new resource created was already getting an HTML version, so we were on our way to reducing the print stock. Right. However, uh, clinicians use our educational resources as teaching tools. So with respect to what works best for our patients and caregivers, print resources could not go away altogether. So instead, we developed a PDF print style sheet for PDFs generated from HTML. And this matched the fact card layout that our graphics team created. So clinicians now had the option to print anything on demand or request pre-printed copies of select resources in the same 8.5 by 11 format. Adding to that, we also introduced a functionality allowing the clinician to send our resources electronically to a patient or caregiver. So yeah, even though we had lots going on with the site at this point in 2015, it was time to make the jump to Drupal 8. And our communications team chose to move to D8 and Alpha instead of upgrading to Drupal 7, simply for the long-term benefits that were to be seen with Drupal 8 and being on the latest platform. So like Drupal 6, we had a very similar setup process. And the difference with migration this time around was that we wanted HTML versions of all of our resources. We took anything that was a PDF only and converted to HTML. And this was accomplished by taking the source file, in this case, InDesign files, and converting them to HTML and creating nodes in Drupal. So, also this time around, we wanted to pull in more content. We had our in-house published resources and videos. We also carried over the Lexicom content. In addition, we began hosting content from external sources we've selected, which included more text and video content. We added MSKs about herbs database, a tool for the public, as well as healthcare professionals, which can help you figure out the value of using common herbs and dietary supplements. And lastly, we added presentations and webcasts to the mix, and we're pulling in our virtual programs, online support groups, from the event section of our site. All right, now that the content was set up, we can talk about implementation with Drupal 8. And I've broken this down into five categories where we saw the biggest changes to our site and user experience. So with the admin UI, we reworked everything from the ground up. You'll notice in this view, we have filters for just about any type of data our health ed specialists uh, would enter as per their workflow. They were also able to keep track of their revision workflow completely on Drupal. Um, we have set up spreadsheet exports that are easily customizable and pull any fields admins may need for a quick glance. So you can pull data such as languages available, readability scores, word count, many other uh, types of data. Uh, recently, we added Google Analytics page views and even print order quantity to the spreadsheet per each node. So these are just things uh, that help our health ed specialists make decisions day to day. Yeah, and here's a screenshot of the note edit form. Uh, one nice thing to note in here, that we needed a method for our editors to add those readability scores for each node. So this actually used to be an Excel spreadsheet that uh, our health ed specialists maintained, and now they just enter it here in Drupal. And this simple YAML notes field gets populated with readability scores and gets pulled into an admin spreadsheet export for just a quick way 
to view and filter through. And regarding revisioning, we do have content moderation turned on. Content moderation has made it easy to revert to previous versions and see notes documenting uh, changes for each. More recently, we added the option for admins to generate a PDF of previous revisions. This has come in handy when needing to provide a snapshot of what was published on any given date. So think legal concerns, audits, this feature keeps you covered. So now I'd like to talk a bit about our translations and how we're handling those now. We're actually using Lexicomps as a, I mean, I'm sorry, LinguaText Drupal module and professional translation service. So LinguaTech does offer machine translation options as well, for those curious. But of course, in a healthcare setting, you might not want to trust Google or Microsoft just yet. Uh, we've done some custom work on our end. I'll show you a little bit about that. So here's a peek at our translate form. And you'll notice we are bringing in Lexicom status codes, showing you progress from source to target language. And it's a quick method for our editors to actually push the English source content out to Lexica, uh, to LinguaTeX linguists, and once again to download when the translation has been completed. Uh, we recently turned on automatic publishing, so even that step is now automated. And you'll also notice here on the right-hand side that we're listing image translations. So my team works with our graphics departments to create images to include in our educational resources, and often they can be of anatomy, as seen here. Uh, so these are just PNGs. Um, so not text that can, ca can be captured when we push a note to Lingotech. And working with Lingotech's desktop publishing team, we've set it up so that via FTP, we send and receive any images for translation. So a process we are currently working on automating as well. Okay, lastly with translations, I just wanna show you a quick look at the bulk operations with the Lingotech module. You can filter by content type, select as many documents as needed, and upload source, or download all available translations for each. So with Lingotech uh, to date, we have 87% of our content available in Spanish and Russian, and we're hoping to expand on that number and for other languages this year. So jumping into the search engine we are using now, it's important that patients and caregivers find the resources they need fast and with ease. So we actually made the switch to Algolia instant search in 2018. And I'll show you how great this is. The next slide is just a quick demo. I know that's smooth with this GIF, but uh, it's as simple as you can imagine. Type in your keyword and find resources. And we also have several search refinements or facets known with Algolia. Uh, we've determined would be helpful for users. You can filter by content type, language, category, and disease. You'll see that on the right-hand side there. So yeah, if you'd like to learn more about the Algolia search integration, I've added some helpful links to this deck for reference, and I'll be sure to share the slides on the uh, Drupal NYC meetup page. We've also been talking a lot about PDF generation, so here's some helpful links for that as well. And I won't go into depth on these, but we'll certainly make available a review. And some links to modules that help my team achieve what we needed with PDF generation. So with all the work we've done to make HTML to PDF work and look as good as it does, we had no reason to hold on to the fact card format any longer. Yes, we do recycle. <laughs> Adding to that, we are even offering a large font PDF version of our resources and just a nice addition for accessibility. All right, so now I'd like to talk a bit about the editor experience and what we are using in D8. Our WYSIWYG is a CK editor with some enhancements and we've decided that we've decided to make over the years. So I'll go over a few of our favorites. We've added the print PDF style sheet in CK Editor, so you'll notice in the screenshot from the note edit form that we're actually seeing what the PDF print version will look like right in CK Editor. So a nice to have as our editors are maintaining HTML and PDF versions of resources. Okay. 
Also, when thinking about our content editors maintaining two versions, uh, we had to create a method to preview a PDF and return to editing. So to accomplish that, the preview button in the note edit form now opens up a PDF with a link to return to content editing, as you'll see on the right hand side here. This one's cool. Okay, we've also added the code mirror module, which improves the source view in CK editor. Uh, this has helped prevent syntax errors for our content editors. So if they didn't close a div or anything like that, no problem. It'll just yell at you. And my personal favorite has been the IMCE module. Just, I don't know what IMCE stands for. I Google it, can't figure it out, I don't know. But it doesn't really matter, it just works. <laughs> if you need a better way to manage images in Drupal, this is it. Create shared repositories for images to be used in multiple nodes, store and manage your source files. It's really a powerful tool in our day to day. Yeah. We've also enabled CK Editor templates. This we use to display a menu with reusable code for our content editors. Right now we're using it for icons, callouts, and things like that. But in general, just helpful when you don't want to remember long snippets of code. Lastly, and this is something we implemented just a few weeks ago, um, we're using Entity Embed to allow content editors to add and edit snippets of text within a node's body. So imagine if we have several resources with the same section detailing water restrictions for a patient having surgery, and those restrictions change hospital-wide, we can make the change in one place, sync, and track the revisions. So this is promising to be another very powerful tool in our day-to-day. All right, now that I've covered how everything is created and updated, we can talk about how everything is distributed. So as I mentioned earlier, the printout is still necessary for clinicians. Um, so every resource we create is available to print on demand as an eight and a half by 11 PDF. We do also offer select resources that will print and deliver through a third party vendor for those clinics not equipped to print resources on demand. All right, for requesting those printouts, we've got the web form module installed on our site and have made our educational resource request form accessible for internal users. So we set it up so that the user logs in and their delivery information is pre-populated on the form, making it uh, quick to create a submission. We've also made it easy for internal users to store lists of resources by creating a bookmarking function. You just check the resources off right there on the left-hand side and populates on the right, as you'll see here. So these are stored on their profile to reuse as needed and a quick access kind of thing, sent to patient, print, um, very good tool. Tied to that, we added a function that takes your list of resources and generates a PDF bundle in the language of your choice. Okay. Probably the most important integration is our send to patient functionality. So internal users can take their list of resources and send it directly to a patient or caregiver along with a custom message. So if the patient is a MSK, a patient portal user, we pass the resources and the message over to their inbox in their patient portal account. We're also able to determine the patient's preferred language from this integration and send resources in the language the patient identifies. Okay, and we've also optimized our pages for AMP or accelerated mobile pages. <clears throat> AMP is essentially a framework for creating fast loading mobile pages. It's a Google backed product and we've been able to optimize our pages for performance on mobile. On the right is just a preview of what you are seeing with an AMP ready page. Okay, here I'd like to show you something we prototyped recently. This is our communication board for internal users. This was created to help patients unable to communicate. Um, clinicians can build their own communication board by selecting the images they would like to use and a PDF is then generated. Uh, we've also enabled Spanish and Russian translations for this. Um, long term, we are hoping to host frequently used communication tools, including pain assessment scales, just right in here. 
Yeah, and here's a quick demo showing how simple the board is to use. You select the images, you have an option to select translations if available, and you click print. A PDF is then generated for you to print. Simple. Okay, lastly, an important thing we take into consideration in our day to day is user feedback. So, using web forms, uh, we have several surveys throughout the site, some attached to select resources. And these feedback forms have been a great way to figure out issues we just don't think about. So, many of the great ideas we've had actually come from users not at MSK. Yep, and that's all I have for you today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kurt. Not this one. Here we are. <laughs> Thank you, Kermit. Um, does anybody have any questions for Kermit? We'll take some uh, some Q and A. I'm going to come around with another mic. This one. This one. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, Kermit. Hey. Wow, echoey. Um, <laughs> On the image translations, I'm curious about both how it how you deal with or how they deal with the backgrounds being different for different character sets, and and also if if there's a way they try to avoid putting text in images or doing them in overlays on the website rather than in the images themselves. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's still something we're trying to figure out. We have labels on our images. They're hard-coded, right? I mean, what we do is we provide Illustrator files to Lingotech, and their desktop publishing team exports a PNG. You know, we're trying to figure out um, how to work with SVGs, things like that, that we can control a little bit more. Maybe just get a text file from Lingotech and add that translation. Um, yeah, it's still in the works, but does that answer your question? Yeah, and the, and the other one is about translations. Mm -hmm. um, or, or excuse me about search. So when you're in indexing, say, images that have text in them, you want when you do a search, you want to find the images that have that text. Right. How, how are you tagging the images so that they can be found? right? So at, at, at best, I can give you alt text and captions, um, but the labels themselves are not right being captured in that index. Um, as far as I'm, I mean, Jake can speak a little bit more to that, but I think that's it. Right. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say like the editors on the site write great text like so if there's an image that's describing a diagram of some part of the body, all those labels are in the text like they're very clear on that they don't kind of, you know so I, I think all those images will come up in the right context uh, to to add to the S, the resizable images with text floating well that's the problem it's possible in SVG to lay text on images but then to get the SVG to resize correctly with the text floating on the images doesn't work consistently. It becomes an impossible task. We haven't solved it. Maybe we'll use Flash one day. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Questions, questions, questions. Okay, I've got a question. So I saw uh, English, Spanish, and Russian. Uh, is Russian in, in very high demand? Why is Russian the, the third language there? Yeah, so th those choices were based on patient population. So we've been high in Spanish and Russian speaking patients. Um, next up is Chinese. Um, but that's just based on population, right? So, do you anticipate any challenges uh, dealing with Chinese uh, relative to the other languages? No, I mean, setup is basically uh, working with Lingotech on creating these style guides and glossaries, you know, with some interpreters at MSK, you know. Um, so, you know, once that's set up, translation memory kicks in, you know, and things should work. <laughs> but yeah, no issues so far. All right. Last chance for questions for Kermit. Yes, I've got one over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what kind of analytics are you using to, you know, figure out where to improve these things? Oh, uh, right now we have Google Analytics on. Um, you know, we're collecting this data monthly, seeing what pages people go to the most. Like, you mean like distribution-wise or just? Yeah, I'm kind of interested in like what things are helping you yeah. in terms so of figuring out. Pulling lots of that geography data, uh, device data. Um, you know, all kinds of data, um, really, from Google Analytics, whatever I can get from there, and Algolia, too. Um, so I'm able to see what kind of typos they're entering, you know, as they're searching, and then we're adding keywords to improve, you know, search results, that kind of stuff. Any more questions? Yes, sir. So, how do you validate uh, your AMP pages? 
I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The AMP pages, the, you created Google AMP pages, right? How do you validate that? How do I annotate them? How do you validate those pages? Oh, val so we have a, a web team that's completely in charge of that. I won't be able to answer. Jake actually knows the answer. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really important to plug um, Google paid Lullabot to do an AMP module for Drupal and that takes care of like 90% of the heavy lifting and they created a reusable library that will validate all your AMP pages. So there's just like an API you can call and say validate this page and it'll give you a whole list of errors. And so in our editorial workflow, they create the page. When they go look at even it was set up, the one issue was you had to go to the AMP page to see the errors and we made a tweak so that when they're looking at the HTML page, it'll tell them there's errors in the AMP page if there's some syntax. And just for people with some technical, AMP is incredibly strict. It's like a very limited set of HTML tags. And if you add, for example, a script tag, it won't render because they don't support script tags. Um, thanks, Jake. Fantastic. Any other questions? All right, let's hear it for Kermit, everyone. Thank you. Okay, next up we've got Kevin Basrad, and he's going to talk to us about UX editorial shift. And uh, Kevin has over 15 years of experience developing enterprise level Drupal websites. Uh, he's been a part of the Media Current team for the past seven years, and right now he's a VP of delivery there. And he specializes in defining and creating editorial workflows. Uh, and he's worked in the newspaper industry uh, before transferring over to web operations. Um, and what else? Lots of other things. Uh, he's been in the media industry. He's uh, helped publishers create better workflows and has several Drupal core commits under his belt. <clears throat> uh, he's very active in the Drupal community, uh, speaking at various Drupal camps and cons. And uh, yeah, so let's hear it for Kevin, everyone. Hey, Shitty. Awesome. Would have give you the TLDR on that one earlier. I forgot that was going in this. Awesome. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the uh, editorial UX shift. So Kermit, thanks for some of the intro on that because you hit on a little bit of this already. And I might actually uh, go against some of the things you said actually <laughs> on some of the pieces. But um, it's really just a difference in kind of the situations and, and client targets that we're going after and the different sides of it here. So um, as JD mentioned, I'm Kevin Basreb. I'm our VP of delivery at Media Current. So what that means is uh, I oversee all of our delivery operations. So our back-end developers, front-end developers, QA, project management, all the different pieces from there. Um, we're a, as Media Current, we're a, oh, I want that go. There we go. Uh, we're a full-service digital agency. So we're around 80 people, uh, fully remote across the country. Uh, specializing anywhere from nonprofits to higher ed to very large enterprises. So uh, this presentation we're talking about today is actually building a lot around some of our individual client uh, projects and how we have to think about editorial workflows for their editorial teams. We're talking about teams from anywhere from four people to 300, 400, 500 people on their editorial team. So how do we scale that? How do we take that editorial background and kind of build that together? Um, as JD mentioned a little bit, I come from an editorial background. I worked in newspapers. I was, I was actually an editor originally before becoming a developer, per se, professionally. And from that point, I uh, really have focused on any of the implementations I do and work with on cl our clients and how do we help make sure that the editorial workflows are meeting what they're looking for and thinking about different things we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to look for editors. So for today, we're going to be talking a lot about, uh, for this presentation, this is a presentation I gave actually at DrupalCon Nashville. So you can see the original there. I will reference a couple uh, things without it um, to that presentation as well. Um, we're going to talk a bit about how we're understanding that editorial shift, thinking about UX for an editor versus UX on the uh, presentation side, why that matters to a user along the way, um, how we can use Contrib to help with us along uh, making these editorial enhancements so it's not all custom code, um, what kind of custom considerations we want to think about, any future thinking that we're going to be heading to, as well as just how do I do this? What do I do to get my company or our, our team to think about editorial? A lot of times uh, you might be editing content and really wonder, why aren't we doing this? It seems so obvious. Like, how do we start convincing our teams to move in these directions? So first, before we really think about what that editorial shift is, we need to think about where our teams are coming from and what our editors are doing. So... We're here at a Drupal meetup, so all of us know Drupal very well. We're very ingrained in this day to day, but our editors and the people that are working on our sites day in and day out probably aren't as used to Drupal as all of us are and all the ins and outs, the little quirks of the Drupal admin system, things like that. 
Um, often as an agency, we run into a couple different competitors along the way. Oftentimes we run into Sitecore, AEM, WordPress, are things that come up all the time for us, and especially in terms of enterprise level uh, implementations. Those have a very specific editorial experiences and different things that clients expect in those situations. But our editors might be used to different things like Wix or Squarespace, and there might be relating Drupal to those different alternatives that aren't necessarily Drupal along the way. Or even if we think a little bit further out, our editors might be doing something new like Contentful or taking it a whole other level to things like Mashable or BuzzFeed. And they're used to working in those systems. And then they come over to Drupal with all these fields and all this kind of look on the admin and not really know what they're doing anymore. They really get frustrated. And where's my nice drag and drop and my pretty uh, WYSIWYG editor along the way? So our editors, though, when we think about this, they're the core of our sites. They're the core of a lot of the, the projects and the enterprises we're working with. If you're in higher ed, they're putting all that content out. They're really showcasing the voice of your company, your organization, your uh, system. So we need to make sure that they're happy. Um, we're not only competing just for how they're working for you and for your site, but also for how that's mimicking your company or your organization out to the general public. If they're not happy, that's going to reflect in their work, which is going to reflect out to you as a company as well. So when we think about that, when we look at Google, we start thinking about these kind of fun situations. We look at things like Squarespace, and we look at WordPress, we look at Drupal, different things we look at. Everyone always says the well, same thing on all these. Why is something so slow? Um, and we all get very frustrated by this in our ad editor experiences. And I'm not really going to be able to fix that for you today. I'm sorry. Sorry, spoiler alert, but we're not going to be able to fix any slowness. But we can think about how to make your experience better and different things we can do along the way. Um, we are getting better. Drupal 8's gone a long way. Um, but we are getting, we're moving in that better direction along the way. So, um, why does this even matter? Um, I was mentioning your editors are the voice of your company. We need to make sure that they're happy. Um, a lot of times that we spend a lot of our time in implementing sites on what does your homepage look like? What does that initial view that someone lands on your homepage look like? But when we start looking at analytics, users aren't even landing on your homepage. They're landing on interior back pages that nobody even cares about. We design the homepage first, nobody even sees that page half the time. So we come back to our editor, our article pages, our content. Really the guts of your site is what people are doing. But even worse than that is we don't even think about what the admin form looks like. We let a couple developers in there, they just throw things together, put some fields on top of each other, and now our editors just have a whole bunch of soup to work with. People get used to that. You hear all this all the time, we're looking at new implementations. Um, why is Drupal so bad? I don't like Drupal, I wanna move on to something else. And it's because their implementation wasn't thinking of the editor along the way. They, their issues with Drupal are typically issues with implementation, not with the actual Drupal itself and the, the phrase of Drupal. So we have to really think of this in a different way in that we're looking at content management and not website management. As soon as we start reframing our thoughts to content management versus the individual website management, that changes our thinking from an editor perspective. We really need to put the editor first because we don't know where that content's going to go. A lot of times, these websites that we're working with, the content's going to the website, yes. But where else is it going? Is it going to a mobile app? Is it going out to an Alexa device? Is it going out to uh, something we don't even know about yet? Maybe some third-party service along the way. So we got to really think about the content management versus the website management. Get out of the thinking of what we see on the back end is really what we get. It will drive us crazy along the way. Um, so thinking through, jump back over here. Um, so thinking through actually the scale and the editor workflows and why that actually matters in the end. Um, when we don't think about the admin experience, we forget about the visual refreshes becoming so commonplace in the industry now. We're look, seeing a lot within Drupal, um, mentioned earlier, decouple Drupal days is coming up here in New York. Um, there's a lot of work uh, that we as a company are doing in terms of Gatsby. There's a lot of uh, things in terms of decoupled CMSs. The front end of websites and the design of a website is changing so drastically and so quickly. We can't really keep up with that as an industry and as ourselves. But the actual CMS that's powering the system that the editors are in every day isn't changing. Most enterprises, most organizations are working with the same CMS for a long period of time. As Kermit was just saying, you guys are on Drupal 6. Uh, you're now up to Drupal 8. On uh, the newspaper I was at before, we started on Drupal 4, 7. We went up to 5, then 6, then 7. Uh, these companies and organizations stay with one CMS for a really long time. Especially when you start thinking about these really large enterprises, when they move to, an to a new CMS, when they move to Drupal, or if they move to something other than Drupal, 
they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars on that implementation. They're not going to throw it away in a year. They're going to keep that around even if the front ends change. So those visual refreshes are common along the way. Two is that there is a lot more time spent building versus creating the content. If we take this minute to think about that, if we're spending more time building our content than creating our content, what kind of implementation, what kind of due diligence are we doing to our users and our editors to really provide the best value to your customers, to your target uh, within your organization or your, the content you're generating? So if we can inverse that a little bit and let our journalists, our editors, our content creators actually create cool content, that's going to, and then not spend all their time building and making it work in the website, that's going to really help generate more content for your site, better quality content, more engagement, and keep that cycle going. Um, let them get the site, the content up quicker versus um, actually creating the, or versus actually building the content. Finally, when we have happy editors, we're going to have better content. If your editors are happy in the system, they like what they're working in, they're going to be happier to do that. Look at what I was mentioning earlier about Medium or BuzzFeed. Um, some of these newer sites that are strictly about content creation, people go to those sites because the editorial experience is so nice. It's easy for them. They don't have to think about it. It's quick, easy. They move forward. How do we make them do that with their Drupal sites as well? How do they get really excited about going in and logging into their Drupal sites? So it's easy. We just use WYSIWYG. We can, that's kind of what Medium does. You look at these things, like you can drag and drop things around. Everything's kind of easy when you do WYSIWYG. The problem is when you start trying to think about moving things around in WYSIWYG, doing different setups, um, this is where we kind of differentiate a little bit on thinking. Um, oftentimes our clients don't know HTML code. They're not going to know how to do that. Um, and when you start doing WYSIWYG, they are expecting that exact syntax of what you see is what you get. And we all know in this room how much WYSIWYG really isn't necessarily what you get when you do this. If you ever tried moving an image around, you can see how difficult it can be. And then we think back to the idea of content creation or content management versus website management. This content, we cannot guarantee is going to be in this same format everywhere it's being consumed. It can be completely different formats. So how do we think about that power of Drupal and the data structures Drupal provides and keep that going through our content workflows and out to different systems along the way? So what are a couple things we can think about uh, for there? We can look at Contrib really to the rescue. Contrib helps us out in different areas uh, all the time in Drupal. We talk about this through all different aspects. We have Contrib, we have Custom, and um, Community along the way. So there's a couple different options we have. If the slide updates. Let's go this way. There we go, jumping. So we have plugin field widgets. These are things you can use out of the box. Uh, there's a lot of power in these. If you haven't gone through and explored the Contrib community and what kind of plugin field widgets are available, you'll find a lot of different options here that can greatly increase your editor experience without ever touching a line of code. Things like the autocomplete deluxe module or inline entity form or the entity browser module all enhances the editorial experience without actually having to change any code. And there's varieties of these out there too. Like Autocomplete Deluxe has some comp competitors out to it. There's like the chosen module. There's other things for that. Um, any browser, there's different ways of viewing and integrating with content. And this experience that I'm showing on the right is the actual Autocomplete Deluxe module. It's a lot easier to see when you type in uh, different words or different values in taxonomy and have it in a nice, simpler to see situation, especially something like this that's one term. English and British with a comma in it, if that was in a normal autocomplete field, it'd be really difficult to understand what you had to delete if you wanted to get rid of that word from your list. Um, inline any form helps our editors really get content without leaving the page. Keep them on the page. Don't make them go to five different pages to edit one piece of content. Keep them on this page that they're working in. Um, and then any browser for finding content. Like, why do we have to make people remember what a title of an image is? Let's use some of our different options for the Drupal provides to get that content out there in a more visual way which media helps provide for you. Uh, media now is in Drupal core. Hopefully all of you are updated to the latest Drupal cores that came out in 8.4, if I remember correctly, um, is continuing to evolve in every release. Uh, media is continuing to build up and build up. Uh, Dries mentioned this at DrupalCon. There is still work to go in media. Let's not kid ourselves on that. Media has to go a long way still in Drupal, but there are a lot of great contrib options that help get to a better spot with media. NT browser is one of those. Um, over on the right, you're seeing some um, examples of this along the way from some uh, 
admin themes and some different uh, distributions along the way. Uh, things like the focal point module help you out with media. If you've ever gone onto a site and had to deal with different aspect ratios, vertical images versus horizontal images, uh, some really large newspaper organizations, um, very large even cable networks along the, around the company, around the world, have 15 to 20 different image fields on their content for all the various aspect ratios or sizes they may need. Why do we, we don't need to do that anymore. We can get a lot more specific with a focal point module and not worry about if an image is going to be in a vertical sense. Uh, sports sites have a big issue with this. If you've ever seen a basketball player in an auto-cropping image in basketball, it never is very pretty if that was actually a, a vertical or a horizontal image at that point. So use the focal point module, show what the position is, and let ourselves actually, let the system use this in a better way. Uh, Multi-upload, things like the drop zone JS module is great for uploading multiple bits of content at one time, um, and as well as distributions to help you with this. Uh, Media Current uh, uh, runs our own distribution called Rain that we were talking a lot about at DrupalCon, um, as well as things like uh, Aquia Lightning or Berta Media's Thunder distribution all go a really long way to helping to get you a jump start on these type of editorial experiences. What you're seeing to the right here is actually from the Rain distribution, which takes a lot of that takes the Thunder admin theme, then layers on top of that pre-made paragraph modules and pre-made paragraph components to put these different pieces together for you and help give a, a good starting point uh, that you can customize from. Other things you want to think about when we're thinking about our content editor experience that doesn't take actually writing any code is things like the override node options module, uh, going through and actually changing some of those options that you see on the form that nobody actually ever uses. Why put those in front of the editor if they're not going to be used? Get rid of the options that they don't need. Uh, things like the menu per role or admin toolbar modules. Let's go ahead and take our admin experiences and our choices and let's limit those to what our editor needs. If you log in as a super admin and all your editors are super admins, look at all the different fields and choices they have. Those are terrible to see if you're an editor. You don't need all that information. Um, additionally to that, think about the dashboards. What does a user see when they log in? How about redirecting them? Instead of when they log in and getting that terrible, never get styled user profile page, direct them to an admin dashboard that's consistent to what their job entails. Put their content in front of them. Put content that they need to edit. Maybe put some analytics integration there and show what's trending on the site or different things that they can be helpful with. Um, even things such as announcements, company-wide announcements, make that page useful that they land on so that they don't have to take an extra click or dig through admin menus to find what they're looking for. Um, that's great for a, a rookie editor. Um, you will find over time with, with Drupal editors that have been in there a long time, they start URL hacking everything and they don't even bother with dashboards. They just go right to their page. But it's good to still put them into a good spot. Let's set them up for success rather than make them find that and, under, and do that from the beginning. Finally, things like field group. If you've ever really looked at uh, node forms that haven't thought about the organization, what I was bringing up earlier, if you take a node form that has 50, 60 fields on it and you're not using field group, you just end up with a whole bunch of field vomit all over your node form that doesn't really work at all. Um, think about, I'll, I'll take that away so we don't have to look at that any further, but think about, um, think about um, how to take vertical tabs or horizontal tabs and group your content up into something that's more reasonable. Guide your editors through the process. Don't give them... 30, 40 fields to deal with. Try and generalize your fields instead of taking an individual one for every single thing. Maybe we use a paragraph component. Maybe we actually abstract a little bit and, and do some interesting things on the development side to break up field content and make it easier for editors to know what they need to enter. So Contrib is only going to get you so far, though. Uh, Contrib takes you a lot of the way, but there's still always very custom things that editors need and custom things we can do to help make our editor experience even better. Um, so some of the things we like to think about there is just other modules and uh, paragraphs and implementations we can do to help make that experience better. Um, again, with the, uh, the rain distribution, the Thunder admin, um, and some of the stuff that Lightning's done as well, there's a lot of great uh, new functionality within the paragraphs module now uh, for the UI. Uh, so things like adding above a current paragraph, removing or duplicating, doing uh, things with paragraph preview module to preview what something's actually gonna look like as an individual component all help you out on that customization of architecture and taking something that's a, a core, not a core module, but a contrib module that a lot of people use and building upon that, finding new uses for it, finding new UI for it, and thinking about what an editor sees when they view a, view a page. This looks a lot nicer than a typical paragraph UI when you, when you look at that along the way. Uh, the thing to highlight there is the add above. Uh, this is really a nice feature along the way um, that comes from 
I believe that's coming from the new, actually it's in the core Paros modules now. Even It was experimental when, I, when we re first wrote this presentation. Uh, front layer also, think about what an editor sees. As I was talking about earlier, we're talking content management, not website management. So something to think about is caricatures of your content. So rather than looking at your content as a direct representation as a preview of what an editor is going to see on the front end, do a caricature that gets them in the right place, but doesn't make them think that it's going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. This is really helpful when you're using a lot of external sources. You cannot guarantee what that content is going to look like on all these various devices, uh, maybe voice systems, things like that. But if you give them a good sense of what things look like, here's what an image is about going to be. This will be bolded. This, this is still in the same font styles. It's going to give you a better sense of the way. If you look here on the left side, this is what the admin looks like. Um, on the admin side, this is an older uh, implementation of some paragraphs. And on the right is what the real main page looks like of the site. It looks pretty similar. And all this can be done just through some custom twig templating that's built in the Drupal out of the box. Take some of your styles, apply it to it, and all this can be seen on your admin form that way as well. Some other custom considerations to think about uh, um, along the way is don't make editors remember fallbacks. If your content has a lot of different uh, defaults and things involved, put some sensible defaults in place. Um, almost every site that um, I've implemented or that we've implemented, there's usually always a secondary title, a secondary summary field, maybe even a secondary image field, so that on the home page or on a section page, we're not showing the same image or the same title that's on the article detail page. If someone saves that content, just copy that field over um, to that secondary field. And what you're now getting is an editor, when they come back in to edit, they can edit that teaser title. It's already there for them. They know it's there. And it saves you as a developer time from having to put logic in on every component you build to say, if first title's here, do this. If not, do this. And just kind of do those fallbacks. Give a sensible default. Make it obvious on the node form that this field goes to this spot. Uh, don't make editors think about how that content's going to be displayed. If you are making, if you're looking at this different logic you're doing programmatically, how can you make that obvious on the back end? Um, doing those defaults, copying content, uh, setting if, if an editor, for instance, uh, is always working in some different section of the site. So say they're working on sports or they're working on food and they're, or they're working on lifestyle sections of a site, set that on a, as a field on their profile and then set sensible defaults to them whenever they create a new article. Maybe we automatically sent the taxonomy to lifestyle. Maybe we automatically uh, set their author name for them. Just giving some of that de those defined defaults to help them out along the way. When you're thinking about fields, things to do, think about it in terms of what the content is best for that field. So let's not think about our one-off situation. Hey, for this one time in this one situation, we need to do this single thing. There's so many sites that I look at um, that have been around for three or four years, and there's 15, 20 different fields on their content types that were used one time for one week and never used again. Why do that to your, to your initial content architecture? Set that up in more of a sensible default. Think about how this can be used more long-term than for that one-off situation. Um, and eliminate unnecessary, option, uh, unnecessary actions from a user. If there's something they don't need to do, take it away from them. Get rid of it through permissions, hide the field, um, whatever it might be, but try and guide them to what they need. But don't limit them via permissions for the sake of limiting. Nothing will scale your editors away worse than telling them that they need to do this awesome stuff for part of their job. Then they go to do it and they get permission denied. That's going to just totally demotivate them at that point um, when you're trying to help out along the way. So trust your team, trust your editors to do their work, guide them to it, but don't limit them from not doing things. If someone messes something up, try not to keep un, uh, sorry, uh, required fields in place as an option for that. Yeah, we need these five things to make the content look good. But I can guarantee your editors are going to figure that out really quickly if those fields aren't there and you have sensible help text along the way to guide them to that. So Drupal's continuing to evolve. Our editorial experience is going to continue to evolve as well. Where do we go from here? What are the things that we evolve from at this point? Um, what's going to come in the future along the way? So a couple of things we can think about is previewing context versus in-context editing. A lot of what's being talked about in the has been talked about over the past couple of years in the Drupal community is inline editing, but that's directly tied to needing the front end tied to Drupal. We're seeing more and more of decoupled sites progressively decoupling. Maybe we concentrate a little bit more on the actual admin experience versus putting a user into the, the theme layer at that point. 
maybe that's a sign that our admin experience needs a little bit of help at that point too, which is coming as well uh, that we've heard about a lot more at DrupalCon too. But preview in context. Don't make an editor see an exact replica, but get it a character. Think about what it could look like similarly, but not exactly um, along the way. Um, as we think about decoupled editing and, and different pieces like that, you're going to get a little more direct preview options at that point too. It's a little bit easier to get true preview when you go into decoupled situations, but it does take some efforts on the front end implementation to make that happen too. Uh, things like Cardstack, Contenta are all doing this right now. There's a React initiative we've seen happening within the admin system. Um, and even things like Gatsby and their integration with Drupal, uh, integrations to WordPress, things like that are all helping to build that integration a little bit better um, for decoupled editing experiences. Layout Builder, it's coming. It's here. It landed the day in 8.7 as stable. Um, it's a new, new thing coming. We haven't done a lot with it ourselves. Um, we've done a lot of experimentation with it. Uh, reason for us is that the translations and the workflow aren't there yet. Um, it's a great thing for people to be contributing to and help those along the way. Um, but I think that's a really a, a great thing that's coming in the community too to really help push that forward. Um, it's a nicer looking, if you're used to the panels interface from before, uh, takes that, makes it look a lot better, gives more revisioning, functionality to it. I think that's something that's really coming a lot more in the future that's going to be a hard look um, and something that's going to really layer into either paragraphs or take over for paragraphs in the future as well. Um, I'm very much in the paragraphs camp. Um, haven't been, have been a bit... Uh, Worried about Layout Builder a little bit, but I'm excited about where that's coming, how it's going to evolve, how it's going to push the entire admin experience forward, because that's really something that can help us compete um, along the way with different other, other projects and CMSs. Uh, finally, also thinking about lightweight mobile-first editing. Drupal 8 had mobile-first editing available out of the box and core. Thinking about contrib, thinking about the custom implementations you do, can these all work with your mobile experiences too? Editors are more on the, on the run now. Editors are going to want to log into your CMS from their mobile devices. They're not going to always be tied to a desktop computer. And typically, our editor experience has been geared toward a desktop computer. Think about maybe lightening that up. And if you think about what works well on mobile for editing, it's going to also work well on desktop too. Uh, you, can easily add, you can easily take a very simplistic experience for mobile, and that will work on desktop as well. Um, a good example of that even is when you think about voice. What is read is very singular to what you're reading on desktop or reading on mobile. But if what you're doing for voice, it gets a little bit too long-winded oftentimes. But if you take what you put in voice and put it to desktop or reading, it still gets the same point across in a more succinct manner um, and really gets that content to a user in a better way. Finally, thinking about even things like media. Where do we go from there? Uh, thinking about what about using our phone's camera for media uploads? Our editors on the fly, if we're doing a, a newspaper site, for instance, or something else, uploading breaking news or doing things out in the field, using our camera on our phone, why do we need to worry about getting it to a, to a computer at that point? Uh, thinking about those kind of implementations and, and editor experiences along the way. Um, and where do we go from there? Um, this is actually from our, our presentation in DrupalCon about this. The, the site that we were referencing on this uh, had one poor user trying to edit the site on Nintendo Wii on their analytics. I'm sure that did not work out very well for them, but uh, you don't really know where a user is going to be, but it also showcases a lot of where that mobile editing is coming from. iOS is at the top of the list of people trying to work and edit in that site. Um, from there, the rest of the desktops come in. Even Android's coming up the list. So we don't really know where our users are going to be. We know they're moving more toward mobile editing. So we need to be thinking about that in implementations to the future um, and really refining and, and simplifying our sites in that perspective. So all that sounds well and good. Where do we start? How do we get started in this, in this situation? Um, you know, I don't have, I'm not going to be able to rebuild our entire site. We don't have the, the funds for that. We don't have the time for that. How do we start? How do we get this moving for our, for our company and our team? First thing you have to do is talk to your editors. If you don't know what your team is running into, what are the problems that they're running into on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not going to be able to help solve them along the way. Have maybe a monthly meeting with who's actually generating content on your site. Find out what their troublesome areas are. What you're looking at, maybe from a development perspective, is likely not the problems that they're looking at. We focus a lot of our time, I'm assuming a lot of this room is developer-centric anyway, we focus a lot of our time on shaving tens of middle, or hundreds of milliseconds off the homepage load of a site or the page performance. What if we turned a little bit about that to shaving one second off an editor experience time or making one less click for an editor? Those are the kind of things that might be really easy for us to do as a, as a developer but that an editor would find immensely valuable to their day-to-day -day workflow if you just talk to them and find out what they're doing and what their problems are. 
you're not going to be able to do everything. That's okay. But make sure that you're doing something. And then when you do that, tell them, let them know when it releases. Hey, this was a feature that came from your input. Here it is now on the site. Give them something along the way to, to showcase what came from their, their feedback and moving that forward. Um, so that's this side of the presentation. There's a lot of uh, more things you could talk about along the way with editor experience, but that's trying to give you a good uh, idea of where to look at in terms of thinking of your editors first and moving in that direction with Contrib, things that are already out there in the marketplace and, and looking at your editor experiences. Thank you, Kevin. Let's hear for Kevin, everyone. All right, we've got uh, some time for a few questions. Any questions for Kevin? I will come to you. You don't have to come to me. Questions, questions. And that's ready for the after party. No questions. Here's a question. I knew we'd get one. Yes, sir. Um, for floating images, um, someone told me that it's always best to float them right uh, only because of readability. What do you have to say about that? So I am not a designer <laughs> and I'm not a UX expert by any stretch there. Um, but what I would look at is oftentimes um, floating images from a technical perspective is going to work either way. Um, I try to keep them out of WYSIWYG in general. Um, that is actually one of the exceptions we will make is putting floats, floating images or videos into a WYSIWYG because it really does typically stay with the content. Um, and it kind of gets annoying to add another paragraph in just for an image. Um, but I really have no preference in terms of which direction you float the image in. Um, I'd really want to talk to one of our UX experts or, or people on the way from that. Um, typically, when I have requests for that and we see requests for that, the client's looking for option for either one. Um, and from an editor perspective, it's not too much of a difference. Um, it's really that's getting into where the content display is going to be. And on a desktop, maybe it does work better on right, but on mobile, it's going to be more full width or on some other device on your kitchen refrigerator, for instance, it might be something completely different too. Um, so thinking about different ways of that. Um, so not relying on what you put in the editor to be what you're actually going to expect on the front end. Thank you. Other questions for Kevin? I knew we'd get a second question. Yes, sir. Um, what are your thoughts on the Gutenberg editor and where do you see it fitting in? I don't like it. Uh, so the Gutenberg editor is WordPress's editor. Um, I haven't tried to, I haven't got to mess with it in Drupal yet because I know there is a fork for it within Drupal as well. The reason that I've been kind of worried about that or not worried about, but not really trying to implement that and go in that same direction is the data, the external data that we tend to see within a lot of client sites, keeping that fielded structure is pretty important for almost every site we do. Um, we oftentimes, even if it's not happening immediately, um, a lot of our clients are doing digital signage. They're doing uh, mobile apps. They might be doing uh, even things like refrigerators or Alexas or things of that nature. And those types of content really need to stay in that fielded fashion. And layering it into various editors like Gutenberg kind of takes away some of that fielding options along for it. Um, what I do like is some of the new implementations with paragraphs. Uh, things like if you have a, a text field with WYSIWYG in it and limited WYSIWYG options, you can go in between two paragraphs and say split here, and it'll automatically split that into two different paragraphs, and then you can insert an image or something in between and kind of help throw that kind of situation together um, without it being as refined into the editor. I think there, over time, though, that data abstraction is going to come with the Drupal implementations as well. Um, and make that a lot easier to push out to external REST APIs or JSON API or things like that. Um, All right, any other questions for Kevin? Okay, I've got one question for you, Kevin. Um, so you mentioned Drupal 8.7, uh, that was just released today, like five and a half hours ago or something. Um, uh, you mentioned Layout Builder, which is in Drupal 8.7 as a stable module. Um, what else is, uh, I guess the most exciting new thing for editors in Drupal 8.7 and um, maybe also what is the uh, the most challenging thing in 8.7, if you know, uh, or thing you're most concerned about for editors? Pop quiz. Um, so the biggest thing for editors is going to be Layout Builder in 8.7. That's the new thing that came out. Um, each iteration of the point releases for Drupal have brought out some new editorial functionality. We had media, we've had some better uh, translation functionality, we've had... Um, some of the inline form errors, things like that have come out with each of the releases. 
Um, Layout Builder is the new one now. I think the thing that all of us are going to be watching for and really pushing forward on is that Drupal 8.7 drops support for some of the older PHP versions. I think it's 5.3 and 5.4. Um, everyone should already be moving to Drupal, or PHP 7. Um, the big hosts are already uh, deprecating out support for Drupal, PHP 5. But that, I think, is going to be one of the bigger pieces moving forward, is making sure to upgrade to PHP 7. You immediately get awesome performance gains by doing that. Uh, so it's a great thing to be doing on your sites anyway. Um, so that's one of the big areas from a technical perspective. It's also starting to lay the groundwork for Drupal 9 a lot more. I'm starting to lay in some pieces to upgrade the Sim upgrade Symphony, um, putting some pieces in place to help get us to Drupal 9. There's a lot of talk at DrupalCon of moving to Drupal 9 and the, the release dates for that. Um, if I'm, and I'm trying to remember now, it's 20, late 2020, I believe, or 2021 uh, is when that Drupal 9 comes out. Um, but it, helping you set up, if you're staying on top of those point releases, that upgrade is a more seamless process now than ever has been in Drupal before. Um, so if you aren't staying up to date on these point releases, making sure you're doing that. The security team is only supporting the last two point releases uh, before the support for those goes away. So, and Drupal has gotten, as it gets more and more popular, more and more security releases. We're doing bigger vulnerability patches across all our client portfolio once a month now, it seems. Um, and that's something we really need to stay on top of. The more you're at the latest end of the code base, the easier it's going to be to stay on top of that and make your upgrade. And then look for deprecated code, all your custom code. Keep that simplistic to get ready uh, for the Drupal 9 side of it. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Let's hear it for Kevin and all our other speakers today. I sure appreciate it. <laughs> Two microphones again. All right, so we're going to switch back over to our, uh, our normal slide deck here. While we're waiting on the slide deck, um, save the date, July 22nd, uh, Drupal NYC is tentatively uh, co-hosting a uh, PHP performance meetup um, with uh, some other uh, meetups and some other folks uh, in the PHP space. So July 22nd, uh, put that on your calendars. Um, also, if you are interested in speaking on topics of PHP performance, uh, we would love to hear uh, from you about that meetup. Uh, you can talk to me or any other speaker about that. Any other um, uh, organizer, excuse me. Um, what else? Ah, before then, June 5th. That's our next meetup. And uh, we're still waiting to confirm our venue uh, for that meetup, uh, but we do expect it to happen. Uh, and that uh, meetup was just published tonight. So you can uh, go ahead and RSVP for that on the meetup app, um, or you can check your email or visit that link there uh, and RSVP uh, for next month's meetup. All right. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we mentioned before, we're always looking for speakers, organizers, anybody who wants to be involved. Um, for our next meetup, we don't yet have any confirmed presentations or talks. Um, so this is your opportunity to step up and uh, give a talk. It could be short, it could be long. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and you can go to drupal.nyc slash suggest, or you can go on Slack, or you can talk to an organizer. Uh, and it's real easy. We'll get you all set up. Hey, hey, the after party. Okay, so we do not have a sponsor tonight, but we do have an after party, and we're going over to the House of Brews. It's one avenue away, uh, 302 West 51st Street by 8th Avenue. It's a three-minute walk, and uh, we'll head over there. We'll probably hang out here for like 10, 15 minutes or something uh, before we head over there. Um, and yeah, so just, you know, follow the crowd. All right, that's our last slide. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming, and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, if you have any feedback uh, for the organizers, please find one of us. And otherwise, uh, we will hope to see you next month. Thanks, everyone.